where I start, I can I can plan, but the rest is completely um, from the moment. <laughs> wow! Yeah, I have mad respect for that. So it was. So your performances generally and your recordings are generally improvisational in nature, right? Um, yes, yes, um, and the most um, the. The way I like it most is when um, when I only have to record one track and everything is going. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, sometimes uh, I think I've got a, I've got a track recorded and it could use some some more recording and I record a second track or whatever. But um, mostly I try to um, record under live conditions um, because the act of making music is at least as much important for me as the product. The product is nice, you can you can upload it um, in the internet, uh, you can make some albums with it, but uh, the, the process of recording is the thing which really is the main thing for me. Welcome to Ambient Discourses, conversations with musicians and composers who create musical experiences and sonic landscapes. My guest on the program is Alexander, who goes by the moniker Oberlin, and we are going to have a conversation about his brand new album, Von Wegen. And did I get that right? <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, Von Wegen, it's... Uh... I think you can translate it in two different ways. It's uh, von wegen. It's kind of off roads, um, off streets, because all the track titles are street names. Um, it's because um, the the history of the um, of this album is um, I was practicing a bit for a, for a concert I wanted to do in 2020. <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> and. Uh, just uh, just before uh, the summer, uh, when the concert should uh, be in Mönchengladbach, it's a small town in the west part of Germany, um, the Corona restrictions got too too tight uh, to make it happen, and uh, so I did a lot of recording, and I really liked the the tracks which were um, which were developing. Um, and um, just the concert didn't happen. And so von wegen, I, I thought, okay, I take the road names from Mönchengladbach. So I took road names from uh, street names from this town where the concert didn't happen. And uh, von wegen has got another meaning also. It's uh, uh, when things don't happen. Uh, you plan things and they don't happen. Um, you say in German von wegen, uh, so um, so it's got these two meanings, and this had to be the title for the album. That is fantastic. I think that's <laughs> just a um, that's just really magical how all that even came together. I'm curious about your composition style. You said you were preparing and recording for the concert. Mm -hmm. um, what what do you typically do in terms of your concerts? Do you have some stuff that is already preset or are you just rehearsing parts? Or I'm, I'm curious about um, how you prepare for your concerts. Um, I, um, I've got absolutely no uh, presets on this work because everything is going analog. Uh, maybe not everything because I, I've got this uh, Eurorack where some of these modules um, are digital um, but um, but there's no way to, to do some presets. I can um, what I can do is uh, or maybe maybe I start from the beginning um, to explain in this in this um, small Eurorack I have I've got three sound sources uh, which is one oscillator uh, one sampler and um, I plug in my guitar and I split it in two levels, one through a low pass and one through a high pass. Um, so, and these are the sound sources I work with. And the only thing I can prepare is um, I can prepare the samples um, mm -hmm. I want to use um, in the sample player. And um, I can prepare the direction of the signals um, where I want the guitar signals to go through through the low pass, to the delay, and to the um, echo um, echo module, and um, the same with the oscillator. 
and everything else uh, happens live. Uh, so it's I can, all magic I can, in the moment. Yeah, I can I can look where I want to start, but this is yeah. the only thing. The the point where I start, I can I can plan, but the rest is completely um, from the moment. <laughs> wow! Yeah, I have mad respect for that. So it was. So your performances generally and your recordings are generally improvisational in nature, right? Um, yes, yes, um, and the most um, the the way I like it most is when um, when I only have to record one track and everything is going. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, sometimes uh, I think I've got a, I've got a track recorded and it could use some some more recording and I record a second track or whatever. But um, mostly I try to. Um, record under live conditions um, because the act of making music is at least as much important for me as the product. The product is nice. You can you can upload it um, in the internet. Uh, you can make some albums with it, but uh, the, the process of recording is the thing which really is the main thing for me. You and the I process. share a lot in that regard, in that it's all about the experience of creating music and just kind of opening yourself up and just seeing what happens for mm -hmm. good or bad or yeah, for yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even even when the mistakes happen and you're like, oh, I didn't mean to do that, but it's there. It's it's part of the recording. Yes, did, and go ahead. Um, so so if a mistake happens, um, I think. I've heard a, a, a quote of Miles Davis one time, and I, uh, if it's correct, he said, um, if, if there is a mistake, if you make a mistake while playing, play it twice. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> I think that's a, because just, I think you have to accept it. Of course, sometimes yes. then things are happening and you think when you hear them again, oh no, this was a nice moment, but uh, it's, it's, it's not something that you want to present to the public because it's maybe too uh, too far out or whatever. Yeah. Um, but um, yes, uh, I think it's a good lesson for life if you can live with the <laughs> mistakes also yeah. you make. Yeah. That's, that's really refreshing to hear that. And yes, it was, I do believe that was Miles Davis and it is a pretty standard accepted trope within the jazz genre like if you want to if you make a mistake you normalize it by playing it two or three times repeat it mm -hmm. a couple times mm -hmm. and then you've established that all right he must have intended to do that <laughs> <laughs> it's our little secret um i really enjoyed the album so much there were you had some really interesting diverse spaces in there um like thinking of walden hosner um Waldenhausen Hü, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, Waldhausen Hü, yes. Waldhausen, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was that was that was a really interesting way to start out the album. It felt very kind of uh, there was a slight industrial quality to it. Like I think of some of my um, grubby jobs that I've had in my <laughs> early twenties. One job I had, I worked at a um, at a, a warehouse. Ah, okay. And, you know, when you're sorting parts and you're doing something really monotonous and your mind just starts to slip and yeah. you're kind of... And then the sounds of the warehouse just start to... You, you start to notice the patterns of things. And that's what it felt like for me. It felt like oh, you're starting yeah. out with, like, you're just starting to notice the patterns of everything and how everything is cyclical and then there's little intricacies here and there that dot it and then you have all of these other really gorgeous textures in the in the other tracks like Aran and uh Ballymena Walk um and Hyro uh let's see if I can get this one uh Hyro Bamshin Hayabonshin, yes. Hayabonshin. Um, Hayabonshin, yeah. Was that, was that a callback to one of your previous, uh, the previous release 
there was a, is there a track that sounded very similar. It sounded like you were like doing like a like a tape loop, but you down pitched it or something. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's very interesting um, observation. Um, I have to, I have to um, do research by myself. I think. Uh, I think um, it is possible because um, sometimes I use uh, samples because uh, I use samples at, um, several several times without planning it. It's just by accident. Yeah. And it's just uh, you can use one sample in so many ways. So. Um, it's, it's quite interesting what you say because just this morning, um, as a kind of uh, preparation for our um, c uh, conversation, um, I also listened um, to one track uh, from, uh, of, from, uh, from Vegan again. Um, it, was, it was, I think, the second to last, I'm, I'm not sure. And, and this reminded me a lot of... Um, of uh, one track on the album which just came out before on uh, perceptual tapes um, yeah, the softest the, lace um, yes the softest lace um, and Saturday morning um, uh, the Saturday morning track and I think I um, I had the same sample in a different way the atmosphere uh, reminded yeah. me a lot of, of this track um, but it went into another direction with other um, musical backgrounds. Um, so it's very interesting to me that um, you've got this um, observation regarding two, two different tracks. Uh, do you know uh, which one it was you um, um, thought well, of? I mean, there's only three, so it's that, that, that should... You know, it was the, the first track as I went out yeah. one morning. And it, it, you know, it, I think it probably was using the same loop, maybe down sampled, but mm. I like the, I like that you still took it in a different direction on Von Wegen mm. and made it its own piece. And yet it, what it does is it, for me, it does, mm -hmm. it, it creates this thread of unity to the previous release. So there's a little bit of continuity. It's like you're continuing yeah, the musical yeah. story. Yes, ah, that's uh, that's nice to hear because um, yes, I think um, I, I think uh, I try to um, I try to integrate new elements sometimes from time to time. For example, I think on uh, from Wegen, I used a, um, a, a field, field recording setup. Um, I I didn't I didn't use on um, other albums before and. Um, also later not, but um, to try to um, to try to take some elements take some elements further on, because in in the last time I realized um, yes the tracks got quite longer and longer. I started when I started recording it was more uh, three four five minutes tracks, yeah. but now um, when I do a preparation for a setup and I start to play. Um, I enjoy it most when it gets to, to some kind of um, I don't know how to say in English but if immersion is the right word or whatever but uh, to get in this kind of trance to just let it carry you further and further and um, so it's a nice observation to hear for me that it's not just through one song but the elements if if, if a listener discovers, oh, there were elements on other albums before which remind me here and there, just elements. Let's pause the conversation for just a moment and check out one of the tracks from Oberlin's brand new album, Von Wagen. This is entitled Belly Mana Walk, here on Ambient Discourses.
I think um, the the instrument, the Eurorack, it um, it makes sure that I cannot I cannot play the same trick twice. <laughs> but um, but I can play with elements, and yes, I think. This is for me is absolutely okay. I hope, I hope for the listener it doesn't get boring. But I think what you said it um, it um, it sounded like um, if it was in a good direction for you also. Well, you know, if if you don't if you don't have the patience, you're probably not going to listen to ambient music. Period. Mm. But um, <laughs> yeah. I I find that it's it's such a different. Uh, approach to music that mm. I, I consider ambient music to be a lot more meditative and a mm. lot more mm. spacious and it gives you gives the listener time to think and to process to listen more intently to daydream um, or even just flat out meditation and, and observing your thoughts or observing the the experiences in the room around you and uh, it's it's not listening for the for the con the average consumer where they're just looking for something mm -hmm. to make them feel good and get through the day or whatever but it's 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 for me it's different and i'm curious for you how did you get into ambient the the general ambient genre and what were some of the things that were um, inspiring you or feeding your curiosity at the time? Um, that's an interesting question because um, when I began to um, play music with about 15 years, I um, began with guitar and um, I had some lessons, but um, I have to admit I was in my youth, I was quite lazy. I um, in uh, I didn't practice that much, um, and um, I I grew up with the usual rock cliches, I think. And um, yes, I played in in my youth. I also played then in uh, rock bands. It was a, in a heavy band. Um, also, it was early '90s, and the band was which used such grunge elements, etc. And um, then I had then I had a break um, when I did my studies, and um, I don't know when our last band in the '90s broke up um, because the drummer moved to another town. And I thought, oh, it's quite. Uh, it uses uh, or it takes much energy, and you need much energy to keep a band together with yeah. these different individuals and uh, the different directions they want to go. And I needed the energy for other things then. Um, so, and then I had a long break with making music. I just played some guitar at home, and I took it up again about ten years, maybe twelve or fourteen years ago, uh, when I discovered um, the new methods uh, of uh, the new possibilities of recording the instrument and um, I, I bought a, uh, just a uh, just a usual um, digital audio writing um, I think it was a LE version of Cubase and an interface and just to record some guitar and then I discovered this um, digital um, synthesizer uh, software and um, this was a kind of initial um, moment for me when I discovered what nice sounds you can create with um, with these things. And so I tried a lot with this. And the, I think the first two releases um, on my Bandcamp page, um, they are done with uh, digital uh, means, digital synthesizers. And when I, when I got into this um, kind of making music, I thought, okay, oh, okay, this is nice, but I'd rather like to do it with um, hardware. I would like to um, yeah. turn knobs. I would like to learn more about how the routings are done. And I think this, the instruments were, in the first case, um, what brought me to ambient music. And then um, the music, uh, the the only ambient artist I heard before 
in my youth was I think was Brian Eno uh, in the 90s I, I bought one album this uh, No Pussy Footing album of Brian Eno and Robert Fripp and I have to admit in the in the 90s it was very strange to me yeah. and uh, I listened I listened to it but I had to um, it was it was still quite quite far away from somehow this music for me and um, it, uh, when I um, when I um, got into this uh, synthesizer recording more well, I, I discovered much much music also for example the German musical history the Krautrock um, thing um, there were uh, there were many things which were very interesting to me and then the circle closed into it because Brian Eno he recorded with Harmonia for example as well and this 70s um, music in Germany for for example Cluster or uh, Neu um, or um, La Düsseldorf or Kraftwerk the Kraftwerk I think for me were a bit too um, synthetic, uh, yeah. not so not so lively, and I I wanted to use the nice side of um, electronics, but didn't didn't want to make it too um, too industrial, too technical. I what what is important for me is to keep up the the live thing and to play in the moment and to play with the music in the moment. Um, what I can't do is generative music. Um, sometimes I think it's nice to hear when people can do it. Um, well, nice to hear how it develops, but I want to interact um, with the machine life also. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the instrument, I think, was the um, initial, initial uh, how do you say, the, the starting point. Uh, for me, um, with ambient music, and then everything else developed. Maybe, uh, maybe to mention one album at that time was, which was quite important for me, was uh, the Blemish album by David Sylvian because um, I like the atmosphere also very much and um, the way he generated sounds. Even though they are often maybe of digital. Um, background but uh, somehow these um, sound atmospheres they caught me up absolutely and um, were an inspiration mm. um, so what is um, whatever musical backgrounds are, is very widespread and um, I like very much different kinds of music but um, ambient music absolutely wasn't um, what I heard in my youth. It, I, it developed with making music so that I discovered interesting ambient acts and began to listen to ambient acts. But the Krautrock, I think, the German uh, history of the 70s, this was quite important for me um, regarding the experimentation, for example. Also bands like Popol Vu or Can or, um, yes, bands like that. Hmm. I, I <laughs> I find that refreshing because you, it sounds like you are, you're moving towards this um, increased value in experimentation and mm -hmm. play and mm -hmm. exploration and just yeah. seeing what the possibilities are. And that to me, it harkens back to the purity of being an artist regardless of what your medium is like i've i've heard mm -hmm. so many artists painters drawers whatever yeah. talking about it doesn't matter you can be an artist you just have to be willing to play and to experiment and to yeah. venture out into the uncomfortable what is it, <laughs> what happens with this brush stroke i don't know yeah. it might yeah. be terrible it might be awesome <laughs> it might lead to something yeah. else and yeah. i see that pattern in music as well Yes, and um, because um, this Oberlin music, I do a solo. It's a kind of interaction, I think, between me and the guitar and the machine, the uh, Eurorack. And um, so they are taking maybe the part in bands other band mem members would take. So uh, it's interesting to me to do, oh, what, 
I send the signal and what what comes back, what brings the machine back. I can I can turn some knobs, I can try to steer it, but I haven't got it wholly in my hands. I've got yeah. uh, to look what happens. And um, this is the interesting and thrilling part of it, I think. And it's nice when, uh, when the um, recorded results are nice to hear. Um, Course, but um, I think the moment is very is the most important thing. I would agree. The I think being there in the moment is so much more special to be able to experience just the constant flow of of sound and being on the bleeding edge of where is it going to go now? How is it going to evolve? And yeah, and as well as the challenges and struggles mm. that we have as improvisers trying to, you know, when things don't go a certain way, it's, it, it requires cultivating a sense of spontaneity and mm -hmm. flexibility to be able to respond to anything, even no matter how uh, awful it may have come <laughs> out. <laughs> you know yeah, you still yeah. you still have to figure out a way all right how can we take this moment and move it and shift it to something that that feels natural like that this is a natural part of the occurrence of music yes i i think so too and um what i always try and i think it's very hard to play little just to play a few tones but yes. i in most cases, I um, I play too much. I think I try I try to um, take it down to just to play some notes. And often when I hear um, recordings and they weren't so they didn't develop as nice as I thought, then I discovered oh I played too much too much notes. And so I think it's also a way for me and um, the trial to. Uh, take myself back more and take myself more back and more back just um yeah to make quiet to make quiet music and just a few tones and to look where they go and um yes i think this is a kind of a kind of aim which i proceed and i look where it, where it takes me to because i think people nowadays <laughs> Uh, many people are taking themselves too important, and I think it's a, it's kind of hard to take it take it back to uh, to don't that you don't uh, musicians especially if you I played in a few bands and I, the the best bands uh, in which I played and the best interactions always were when when the musicians themselves didn't uh, regard themselves as so important that they have to fill all the space with their own tones of it. They were just to reduce yourself. I think it's very, very important. That is, I mean, that's sage wisdom right there. I, I see that very same goal or aim myself, mm -hmm. the, the tendency to inject too much yeah. into the music yeah. and... Yeah to learn to learn the minimalist art of okay how how little can i make this without mm -hmm. without being too overly assertive and it i think that delicate touch that delicate sense of being able to listen and and learn how to self edit <laughs> but it, in <laughs> yeah. a different way in, in a way that is uh, you're anticipating what your tendencies are and go, all right, how can I maybe cut that in half? The mm. thoughts that are coming through your mind and like, all right, maybe just start with a little piece of that. And Yeah. Yes. Uh, so um, in most, uh, mostly when I, uh, when I realize, oh, this trick wasn't as nice as I'd like it to it to have been, I play too much. So, um, yes. And especially in, in our world today, I think uh, most most problems in our world are because people take themselves too seriously and take their egos too high. I, I think yeah. this is a, 
very important thing to take to take back and also in music. Let's check out one more track from Oberlin's brand new album, Von Wegen. This is entitled Haya Bumschen, here on Ambient Discourses.
What were some of the things that helped you, helped shape your current understanding of the, the necessity of reducing one's ego and mm -hmm. listening and hu humility, bringing mm -hmm. humility into the music? What, what, what kind of helped inspire that, that mindset in you? Um, ah, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm, if, if, uh, if there's been a special musical inspiration for that. I like, I like, okay. I like bands. Uh, and I think this is also in this, uh, um, in this crowd talk uh, scene, which, uh, which use a lot of repetition, uh, repetitions, um, and um, let these things go. But I think it's not just musical um, inspirations. It's um, maybe maybe it's just a, also a question of um, with what character you come into the world, and or maybe all, maybe also it's a question of uh, socialization. And um, I I don't know. Um, so maybe. Maybe it's maybe it's so that I uh, also in everyday life I'm more try to observe things than to be a, be someone who mixes in every kind of pot, or <laughs> like you say. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that sounds. I mean, that just sounds like um, growing into much more maturity and self, not only self-awareness, but awareness of all that's going on around you and prioritizing, observing and listening and, and you get to choose the response uh, as opposed to just reacting to everything that's going on around you. And I see that in a lot in in a lot of musicians especially outside of the ambient genre where mm -hmm. people tend to take their egos way too seriously or their take their music way too seriously um for me it's i've viewing things in like the the grand scheme of things the the, yeah. the larger scope of life that we are a speck on a speck yeah, in a yeah, fragment yeah. of a moment in time and that's it and we are gone and we will be lucky to be remembered at all <laughs> yes absolutely i think maybe maybe there's kind of uh, these um eastern um philosophies in it a kind of um maybe also buddhistic uh, way of um, right. seeing things to um which is kind of opposed to our Western um, thought of growth. We are, we are always, I think, okay, I, I'd like to grow also, but more in a spiritual kind of way, not, not yeah. necessarily in an economical kind of um, way. And I think, yes, and I think um, putting your ego too much, you know, for example, in musical, context um, then this cannot work uh, if you if you want to put your ego on the band and uh, the others uh, so the others have to uh, turn their egos absolutely down and um, I, I never like bands where I, I also play bass in the in the band and I uh, for example I never like bands uh, where someone uh, can I think it's okay if someone wants to write songs and to play them but um, I don't like when somebody tells me what I shall play in the band because my um, the way I see a band, for example, is that everybody brings in his breakdowns and then you create something together, for example. But if one person comes and tells the others, hey, okay, you play this, you play that, you play that, and then we go and uh, I play the guitar solos and uh, whatever. <laughs> I think this this cannot work. Uh, maybe maybe it maybe it can work if you if you want to success and you have a good very good musician and you um, support him with your instruments. But um, yes, that's the financial reasons. Yeah. Usually, I 
this is the same reason I don't understand how how people find it uh, satisfying to play in pure cover or tribute bands. Uh, just uh, yeah, just for the money. I don't know how it's uh, how it's in America, but for here in the um, if you look in the um, on the concerts uh, which are going in Koblenz, for example, there are many, many tribute bands for whatever band uh, from 60s to now mm -hmm. is playing, but um, the local music scene uh, has it ha has it quite hard to um, to get uh, to get places where where the bands play. The, um, um, but cover bands, everything. The people know and transports these cliches are are very well received. I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, we have. You know, we have the same dynamic here in the United yeah. States. Um, there's a lot of cover bands, a lot of tribute bands, um, and people tend to like it. It's their easy ticket to go see. Mm -hmm. Almost the Foo Fighters, <laughs> 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 or whatever the band may yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. But. Um, and I think part of that is how music has become so commodified, where it's treated mm. as mm. a commodity in a capitalistic world, yeah. where it's just, it's, we're looking, you know, people are looking for their quick fix of entertainment and whatever their preference may be. And so they might go see a cover band or they might be go see one of those tribute bands that they play just you know a single band's material and to some extent i think we do have the same struggle here especially in minneapolis minneapolis uh -huh. is a big music scene here yeah and but even the local bands they do have their strong followings but i uh, but i wonder if there is also the same level of struggle in terms of trying to get noticed at all because of how music has been treated as a commodity, as a me, 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 me. I just want to, <laughs> you know, yeah. feel good. Yeah. I yeah. want something to distract me during while I'm working or what have you. Um, and to some extent, and I don't know if this has been the case for you, but for me, this has really um steered me away from capitalism and treating me, my mm. music like capitalism, like becoming less interested in selling it, period, and just giving it away for free on Bandcamp. And if people want to financially back me, great, you can. Here's a means to do that. But that's also why I've got a job <laughs> to, to help, you know, pay for my instruments and all of the mm. subscription services that I have. And focusing just on the purity of I'm going to open myself up to the universe to life, to everything that's going on around me and respond with music, respond with art with drawing, what what have you and leave the money out of it leave the grasping for fame grasping for maximum streams on Spotify and just focus on the purity of being who I am and creating what I what comes to me and I'm curious about your experience and how that's if that's been similar for you or what what you've experienced in terms of consumerism and capitalism and and as it applies to your music yeah um, yes I um, I think when I say um, the moment of uh, making music is uh, nearly the most important for me, uh, of course, it's it's not the whole truth because in some way I really like it, of course, to share to share it. For example, um, uploading it on Bandcamp and um, and I also like to um, um, to um, release uh, some small small amount of CDs or, or tapes. Um, the tapes I enjoy because I can do them by myself and I could can do some cover work by myself um, because okay the tapes I can I can dub them at home uh, one to one on a tape recorder and I can do the covers by myself. Sometimes 
Um, for example, like with uh, perceptual tapes, I uh, let some uh, someone else make it also um, just um, yeah to get in a kind of exchange, and um, f so this is also a kind of creative process for me to to make the tapes to make to make a tape cover and to send it. So um, if I release them by myself, it's only a mini um, a batch of maybe 19. Uh, yes, usually I, I, let the, um, I let them send me 20 tapes and I make one master and I uh, offer 19 tapes and um, this is enough. And of course, you cannot, cannot make any money with it, but uh, this is not the uh, purpose I do it for because I'm lucky enough to have a job which pays my living and I'm really lucky that I can, music, can do music. Yeah. Also, like you said, for um, just for the process, and um, I have to admit, I also tried and I I tried out to upload on Spotify as well, but um, I think I I gave up after <laughs> after one year because uh, the point when it's get too absurd for me was I d I don't need to make money from it, but uh, you have to pay. Even if it's not very much, you have to pay a distributor, and if you don't even get this money back, uh, and even if it's just 10, 10 euros or dollars or twenty dollars a year, I, I don't see no sense in paying something to feed Spotify more and don't get anything out of it. So this kind of system is is really absurd, and I I think I won't um, I won't support it any longer, mm -hmm. but. Bandcamp, I think, is is quite for me. It's quite okay, and just yes. as a possibility to as a platform and to offer some CDs and tapes and um, yeah. yes, yeah. I I I really appreciate and respect that. It's I think there's there is a there is a challenging balance in there trying to balance the the money aspect of making music releasing it um, r making it available for general consumption um, and I and I think you've got a really good healthy balance especially with at the core of your perspective is is this is about me making music and just really being immersed in the in the process and interacting with uh, whatever happens to be at occurring at the moment. Um, <clears throat> looking ahead, um, what what uh, sorts of things are really kind of starting to tease inside your mind and or sparking curiosity? Are are there things that projects that you are looking forward to uh, maybe later this summer and in, involving yourself in? Um, yes, in this um, summer um, we've got some um, some concerts going. In the winter there was really nothing. I did I did almost no recording. In the winter I played some acoustic guitar at home. That was that was all. Um, but now in the summer um, we have I think four or five small concerts going here in in our area. Um, it's um, the project um, I do with Stefan in Klangloge, I also um, uploaded, I think, about three releases on my Oberlin page with, together with him. Um, and um, this is quite a nice um, project for me because Stefan, he's doing um, percussions. And uh, so he, um, so if I have this um, kind of free-floating um, element with guitar and synth and he brings a, a, a kind of earthy element into yeah. the song with this percussion. And uh, there I can go into a dialogue with a, not only with a machine, but yeah. with, a human, with a human being. And um, this is re really very nice. And it's much easier for me to play live with somebody else, for example, in the duo, than to do an Oberlin gig alone. Um, because if you're doing it alone, you always get this pressure to do something. That, um, I think it's quite hard, even if I say I want to reduce myself, but um, on the other hand, there's this thought, okay, the people, they, people want something and 
uh, you have got to keep the thing going, uh, and you cannot turn yourself down, let some uh, out, let somebody else continue and uh, set up for for the next preparations for the next thing. I think um, so. I do Oberlin gigs alone quite seldom. It's maybe one or two a year. Um, but I, I like it. I like it very much. And um, um, but it's kind of um, exhausting uh, um, this uh, this live experience. I can do it for maybe three quarter of an hour, um, and I'm through. And with Stefan or also when I play with other people and it's a band, it's uh, it's not so exhausting because you've got someone else with you and you can. Genesis back, you can interact, and I'm really looking forward to these um, to these concerts now, especially in the summer. Maybe do some recording um, also, but um, the live I think the live thing is the one I'm looking most forward to at the moment. Mm, yeah, yeah, I I agree. The, playing alone is exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. There is there is so much pressure to. Yeah. Uh, to keep the momentum of the music going and to try different directions, but conservatively enough that you don't go too far out on the limb and then end up in a place where you just can't sustain it, <laughs> can't sustain it anymore. But I, I've just found this conversation absolutely refreshing, Alexander. <laughs> and I thank you really, very much for having me, here, Mike. Yeah, I really I I love your music. I think it has some fabulous textures in it. You you have a lot of inventiveness in it and it it feels just like a little piece of your soul or your experience and it's 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 a, just a delight to listen to it and to and I encourage everyone else to give this a listen to. The the album is von Wegen. And it is out on Shimmering Mood, Shimmering Moods Records, and was released back on May third. Um, my thanks to Overland uh, Alexander. Thank you so much for this conversation. I really many many you. thanks for having me, Michael. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much.